Hello, my name is Justin Kramer and I'm the author of this lumbar puncture module. Now, I wanted to record a short video for the beginning of it in case you didn't want to read through the whole module. These are the highlights of what I tell residents before they go in to do a lumbar puncture. I'm going to be covering mainly the anatomy and procedure sections of this module. So I'm going to start by talking about bony anatomy of the vertebrae. Now it's easy when you're first learning vertebral anatomy to kind of just think of the vertebrae as a circle. You've got vertebral body to pedicle to lamina to spinous process and back again. But when you really look at them you see that the vertebrae are actually a pretty complex 3D shape um, and I think understanding that a little bit better helps with performing lumbar punctures. The first and big thing I point out is the shape of the lamina. So it's actually sort of uh, uh, sloped up and in and it's very broad and that'll be relevant when I talk about needle approach in just a little bit. Um, and then you have the spinous processes at the midline. In a young healthy person without any significant degenerative disease that's not a big issue but with degeneration as I'll show you in a little bit you get bulky osteophytes and that can pose a problem. So people who do lumbar, lumbar punctures blind without fluoroscopy go interspinous. They go between the spinous processes and that works fine in a young healthy person but in somebody with degenerative disease um, that's not as, uh, as doable and we tend to not do that under fluoroscopy. Um, then the last landmark I want to mention is the interlaminar space. That's our target. So you see you have lamina here, you have lamina here. The space in between is the interlaminar space, and that's how we get into the spinal canal. One thing to note, this is how it looks. If you rotate a patient oblique, it tends to open it up a little bit and make it more prominent. Um, again, not critically important in young healthy people, but uh, as you get more degenerative disease, that can be a really helpful tool to help open up, open up your target. All right, so now I'm going to move on to some pointers about selecting a level to go in at for a lumbar puncture. Now there's, if you have a prior imaging to compare to, all of this kind of goes out the window and you just need to find the space with the most CSF to go after. Um, but if you don't have prior imaging, which is often the case, these are some good pointers to consider. So the first thing is that L1-2 tends to contain the conus, so you should really never do a lumbar puncture at L1-2. L4-5 is the most common level to have severe spinal canal narrowing, so that's also not the best level to go in blind at. And then finally, L5-S1 occasionally doesn't even contain CSF. The spinal canal terminates superiorly to that, so it's not the best level to go in blind at. Um, that being said, it's often the most open looking level, and so it may be your only option, and usually there's CSF there, so it's not totally unreasonable to go in at L5-S1. But generally that leaves you with L2-3 and L3-4. These are the best options if you're doing a blind lumbar puncture. And again, all that goes out the window if you have prior comparison studies. Um, then you just um, look at it and pick the best level. All right, so then I want to make a couple points about uh, needle approach and driving a needle as well. So um, if, if you look at the structure of your typical spinal needle, you have a notch in the bevel, uh, sorry, a notch in the hub that points the same direction as the bevel below. And so generally you point your notch away from where you want the needle to go, and then you bowstring the needle away from where you want to go as well, and you can see that that drives the needle tip in the direction you want to go. So the notch is pointed to the right, the needle goes to the left. And that's very fundamental. Uh, the other thing I tell residents is that I spend the majority of my time establishing the right needle trajectory. I always tell them don't confuse needle depth for actual progress because pushing a needle through the skin doesn't take any time at all, but it's actually establishing the correct trajectory that takes forever. I'm not afraid to pull the needle all the way out of the skin and, uh, and restart to get the best purchase and best trajectory possible. Once you have that, the rest of the procedure goes very quickly. So that being said, this is my preferred trajectory. You can see I'm definitely not going interspinous. I tend to start down and out and aim up and in. And the reason for that is if you're going up and in, your bevel is going to be pointed down. And worst case scenario, if you hit the lamina, with your bevel down, it will tend to just slide right up the bone that is actually angled up and in towards the spinal canal as well. So uh, if you hit bone, you can say, well, I'm on the lamina. I just have to direct up, and it should do that without any problem, and your slide right into the spinal canal. You know, contrast that with uh, hitting the upper lamina here and trying to steer down. It's much more difficult, and a lot of times you end up hitting bony structures inferiorly as well. 
The other benefit to starting more laterally is that it avoids the spinous processes if you have big bulky osteophytes. Again, not as much of an issue in younger people, but it can be a problem as people get older and, and have more osteophytes projecting off their spinous processes. So in general, this down and out approach is what I find to be the best approach uh, uh, for getting in. I always tell residents as well, if they're having trouble getting in and they want to call me back to come check, um, always get a cross table lateral first. I find cross table laterals to be invaluable. You go from being not quite sure where your needle is and not quite sure why you can't get CSF to knowing exactly where it is and knowing if you need to advance or withdraw. And I think a lot of times um, you, know, you get a cross table lateral and it just answers all the questions. Finally, I want to show the effects of degenerative disease on a severely degenerative model, uh, the last model on the website. A couple different things worth discussing. This is a spinous process that has bulky osteophytes projecting laterally, and that's what they tend to do. So here's your interlaminar space here. You can imagine that if this is your needle approach and you hit this osteophyte, you're pretty much sunk because you'll try to direct laterally and then all of a sudden you'll see your needle uh, well lateral to the interlaminar space and the spinal canal. So uh, osteophytes can be tough to direct around, but if your needle's going this way, you'll avoid the osteophytes altogether and they're not a problem. Uh, the second thing I'd point out is that facet joints can also get extremely bulky osteophytes. This is a nice example here. On a young healthy person you might look at the facet joints and think, I don't see how those would ever be a problem. They're so far lateral. But you can see how bulky those osteophytes can get and this would completely block any needle approach to the interlaminar space here. Sometimes there's no space at all just from a combination of osteophytes from different sources. So if you don't get in at a level, you might have to try another one. I always tell people to prep wide when you have somebody with severe degenerative disease and plan on uh, trying at several levels if necessary. But you can usually find a level. Here's an example of a good target within the uh, interlaminar space. Um, you probably would have to oblique the patient to make that stand out. The spinous process might block that. So all the tools of starting down and out and going up and in and obliquing the patient would be key to getting this lumbar puncture. So those are some of the major points I go over with residents before they do their first lumbar puncture. I hope you found it useful. Thank you.